Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House checking out some of the guns they have for sale in the upcoming June of 2015 regional auction. What I want to look at today are a pair of Jocelyn carbines. These are breech-loading, single-shot carbines from the U.S. Civil War era. Uh, of course, the U.S. Civil War happened right about the same time that the self-contained metallic cartridge was developed, and this led to a whole spree of innovation of, of a lot of different inventors trying to get military contracts for the new technology, uh, new breech-loading rifles and carbines. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of development or army acceptance of infantry rifles that were breech-loaders, but there was a lot of it with cavalry carbines. There's a whole slew of different versions of cavalry carbines that were actually purchased and used by the Union Army. And of course, one of them is the Jocelyn. Now it's interesting, as a little side note, uh, Benjamin Jocelyn, the inventor of these guns, was actually related to one of the top executives at the Colt Company at the time. And while there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interaction, it, he may have been able to make use of that connection to help get himself a military contract. Now originally, uh, Benjamin Jocelyn had invented this as a percussion uh, rifle, would have used a paper cartridge and a percussion cap to fire, and that was in the 1850s. By 1862, he had perfected a rimfire uh, breech loader. That would be this front gun here. It was a very simple gun. It doesn't have to be all that complicated. It's a single shot breech loading carbine. Uh, they kind of impressed some of the Union officers that were looking for guns. Uh, the, the barrel is mounted very high in the action. It's nice and easy to load. Uh, the guns are short and light. You're looking at like six and a half pounds for these. So uh, fairly handy guns. And he got a contract from the Union Army to make 1862 pattern Jocelyn carbines. These chambered a proprietary 54 caliber rimfire cartridge. And the Union actually wanted a lot more of them than he was able to successfully produce. Um, definitely ran into some, some production volume issues. And, and some, several of his last contracts were for many thousands of guns, and they went largely unfulfilled. He was only able to deliver a small fraction of the number ordered. So that kind of put the Army off a bit. But Jocelyn was in the process of improving the gun. He made some changes that we'll look at here in a moment. Uh, but when he came up with the 1864 version, he then went back to petition the Army to try and get a second chance to make large contracts of guns. And they gave him the second chance, and he was able to make good on it. Uh, he made several times as many of these 1864s, and by the end of the war, it was actually successfully producing guns at a very pretty high volume. So in total, um, 16,500 of these guns were made. Most of those, but not all of them, uh, went to the Union Army and probably 80% of the guns that were sold to the Army were the 1864 version, the later one. I should also point out the later gun also changed its chambering and actually used 5650 Spencer ammunition, or uh, 5652 Spencer. Makes sense, you know, the Army had a lot of Spencers, it stocked Spencer ammunition. If you're gonna make a single shot carbine that's basically the same size, uses the same size cartridge already, you might as well make it for standard ammo get the Army a little more interested in working with you. So he did that. Um, one other last interesting side note before we bring the camera back here and look at the details of these is that the Springfield Armory, U.S. government armory, actually bought 3,000 of the breech uh, assemblies from Jocelyn and then built brand new infantry rifles using them uh, right at the tail end of the Civil War. That is actually the first mass-produced uh, breech loader made by the Springfield Arsenal. So it's, uh, for a long time, those were thought to be conversions uh, until information came out in the 70s, actually showing that they were, in fact, new manufacture breech-loading rifles from Springfield. So, at any rate, uh, why don't I bring the camera back? Let's look at the details and the differences between the 1862 and the 1864 versions. So the basic action of the Jocelyn is very simple. We have a breech block. We have a hammer. We have a little finger groove hook on the breech block. Lift that up, chamber a cartridge, close it, fire. Like I said, very simple. Now there are some interesting details here. So for one thing, we have a kind of clever extractor system. This blade looking piece right here is actually your extractor. So you can see that it gets wider down here at the back. What happens is in conjunction with this angled surface right here, when you put a cartridge in, this angled surface forces it to, to uh, seat all the way in the chamber. 
and then this blade hooks around the rim. So when you open it, as this expanding area comes through the rim of the cartridge, it pulls it backwards out of the chamber, extracting it. And you can pull it out, or if you open this briskly, I suspect it will toss the cartridge completely out for you, making it very easy to then drop another one in, drop the block, and repeat. The firing pin here is free-floating, or I'm sorry, it's spring-loaded in 1862, and it is a rim fire, so the firing pin is up here at the top of the breech block. Some of these guns were later converted to center fire. Um, in fact, they were converted by Springfield, and in that case, they typically filled in the rim fire firing pin and replaced the hole with a lower one. Now, that's the 1862. The 1864 uses the exact same basic idea, except they had determined, they kind of discovered that this, this friction lock, there's a little spring-loaded ball-bearing detent system that snaps that into place. That wasn't sturdy enough, and it tended to come open when people didn't want it to. So in the 1864 model, they replaced it with an actual spring-loaded catch. So to open this one, you have to pull this knurled knob out and then lift up. Now, it does have a, uh, an angled cut and a spring, so you can close it by just pushing it shut and it'll snap into place. But then you have to mechanically pull this back to open it. So you can see here, they also shrouded the firing pin, so it's less likely to be accidentally bumped when you don't actually want it to be fired. Uh, the ext extractor remains the exact same mechanism and idea. And those are really the only two functional changes in the gun. On the 1862 guns, the, uh, the maker's markings, the, the patent markings and the serial number are on top of the breech block right here. They changed that in 1864. We still have a serial number on top, but the actual patent markings, this is going to be hard for me to get on camera. The patent markings were moved to the back surface of the breech block. Something else interesting to note that may come up for collectors is on the 1864 model, the butt plate is marked US. On the 1862s, it is not. However, these were, in large number, used by the U.S. military. So just because they aren't marked here doesn't mean that they weren't used. Uh, they just didn't happen to put that marking on them on the early guns. So these, of course, were all cavalry carbines. They had sling rings and bars on them. Uh, there was some field testing that was done um, of the 1864 model, and it got, actually, the, right, the carbine got generally a negative review. Uh, in large part due actually to some poor ammunition and poor understanding of the guns. Um, they had some Spencer ammunition at the time that apparently wasn't well made and didn't always fit well and occasionally apparently would actually pop the breech block open upon firing. And that didn't make a real good impression on the, the Union officers testing them, but frankly it seems like that's the fault of the ammunition and not the guns. So, should you get one of these and want to go out and shoot it, 5650 two Spencer ammo should fit just fine and should make this a really nice pleasant shooter. Well, thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, of course, these two guns are both available from Rock Island for sale coming up at the end of June, so if you take a look in the description text below, you'll find links to the two different catalog pages for these guns. One of them is in a lot with a second gun and one is a standalone sale, so you can check out the pictures, the description, and uh, if you're interested, if you just can't live without having these yourself, place a bit online and best of luck to you. Thanks for watching.